Welcome, Greenhouse, to Church Online. Excited to have you join us. If you're here for the first time, thrilled that you're checking things out, exploring God, faith, and spirituality, and praying you sense God's peace, comfort, and joy in the midst of all this. Listen, let me start with a little bit of family time. Here's first things first. We are praying for health safety and protection, especially for those who are medical professionals, first responders, essential personnel. Listen, from all of us, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. We're praying God's grace and protection over you um, and, and praying God's peace especially. We are in the midst of obviously tumultuous times. Things are somewhat uncertain. And so if you'd like to stay in touch with what's happening at the greenhouse, um, go ahead, like Jaleesa mentioned, follow us on social media. Stay in tune with the website. We're kind of taking things week to week because that's where they're at. And uh, so that's where we're going to be going. But I'm excited. We're in the midst of a series called You Can't Cancel Church. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can't cancel church. Why? Because it's, it's who we are. Now, now I, I got to admit, this, this sort of sounds good, right? This, this feels good. Where it's kind of anthemic. You're like, yeah, come on. But, but I want to really poke a little bit deeper into this thought, into this premise, and really ask the question, what does it mean to be the church, the, the ecclesia, the, the called out ones, the family of God, what does that actually mean? And so biblically, I want to take us back to what I'll kind of call the, the original recipe, right? The first followers of Jesus. When this all began, I want to take us to the book of Acts. And so if you have a Bible, if you want to flip to Acts chapter 2, otherwise we'll have it up on the screen, your little sky Bible there for your viewing enjoyment. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, if you're ready, say, let's do this. Here we go says of the first followers of Jesus, they devoted themselves, verse 42, to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. Now all the believers were together and had everything in common, and selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And check this out. And the Lord added to their number, what does it say? Daily, cada dia, every single day, those who were being saved. Would you join me as we pray? Jesus, Speak to us, remind us, call us, encourage us to be who you've created us to be. And if you agree with that, say amen. Amen. Let me go ahead and start it here before we go anywhere else. Homeschool parents. Wow. Wow. On behalf of all of us human beings right now, um, we just want to say you deserve a medal, okay? We, we'll, we'll give you a collective round of applause right now, okay? My wife and I have two young children. We got a three-year-old. We have an almost nine-month-old, Liam and Lucia. And so my wife works as a teacher online, so her job is ramped up. We've had to sort of re-engineer our entire church and plant it all online. In the midst of all of that, we've got very energetic, lovely, beautiful, precious children who, who are, are hanging on our legs, it feels like, all the time. And, uh, and, and so the the struggle has been very real. Parents, can I get an amen? I remember sort of at the beginning of all of this, my son's uh, little preschool had canceled. And so uh, I got home and I opened the garage and my son comes running out and he's li he literally starts jumping in place. Dad, 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 dad. He's so excited. I'm like, son, what's up? He said, dad, mom made a list and I love it. I was like, whose son are you? They're not like these, these are words I have. I don't think I've ever uttered in my life, like ever. And so I, I went inside, and sure enough, my wife had created this list of what was happening, and it was color coded with these little crayon colors, and and it had different things. And she was checking, and my son was all about it. And I remember thinking to myself, I totally married up. Like I, I'm pretty sure I, I married. I won the lottery when I married my wife, the Bodiqua beauty Nancy. And and I just remember, and and looking at that, I'm like, man, my wife. Now, now, to be clear, some of your parents like, before the guilt and shame keep creeping, that has not worked in the same way every single day since then. But it was amazing initially, and I thought, man, my wife is the real MVP. Why? Because she prepared differently for this very different season of life. Here's where this goes when it comes to, to us, when it comes to Greenhouse, when it comes to the church. See, the vision has not changed, but the landscape has changed dramatically. 
I mean, we've tossed it out. We talk about it all the time. Our, our passion, our dream is to be a Book of Acts church in the 21st century, which is great, but now we're in the age of quarantines and social or physical distancing. And so it begs the question, how do we meet daily in the temple and house to house? How do we devote ourselves to fellowship, to, to the meeting of all the needs amongst us when we can't physically be with people right now? But the vision is still the same. To be this book of Acts church in the 21st century it was raw, it was real, it was organic. People on the outside looking in were craving to be a part. And as a matter of fact, every single day they were added. Here's what I want us thinking about. If the vision has not changed, which it hasn't, how do we now need to re-envision the vision in this season of physical or social distancing? How do we need to re-envision the vision? How do we need to recode discipleship to grab something from Pastor Matt over there in Gainesville? Here's my thought. Uh, this, this is kind of the big idea. I'd encourage you to jot this down if you're taking notes. If we want Book of Acts realities, we have to devote ourselves to Book of Acts priorities. If we want Book of Acts realities, we have to devote ourselves to Book of Acts priorities. So let's dive in and take a look. We know through the scripture, through the passage, they devoted themselves to a few core things. The first one, let's start here, is this, the apostles' teaching. This is pointing to scripture. This is talking about the Bible. Um, I mentioned this briefly last week, and I've talked about it in various Facebook Lives and different posts. Um, if you have ever endeavored or desired to have a stronger devotional life, a stronger time right here in God's word, this is your moment. Turn to somebody and say, this is your moment. If you're alone, type in the chat, this is your moment. This is your moment right now for you're like, man, I've always wanted to spend more time in God's word but man, you know how it is. You never have enough time in the day. Oh, we all got enough time in this day right now. I mean, we've got, we've got the time. This is an opportunity and we can do it together because we're better together. We've had our online microchurches, which you'll hear more about in the close, and I would deeply encourage you to check out and jump in on these life-giving, uplifting communities that we're doing online. They've begun doing all sorts of creative things when it comes to helping people engage with Scripture. My wife and I lead a microchurch on Wednesday nights, and so we started a, a shared sort of Bible reading plan on version. all sorts of cool things that you can do where different people can join. I didn't know this at first, but you can kind of see who read and who didn't, so it's built-in accountability right there, and you can share thoughts at the very end. We've got microchurches. In our microchurch, we have a group messaging app called GroupMe. And so we said, man, let's, let's have three people every single day in our online microchurch post their soap journal, which is like a basic personal Bible study format, scripture, observation, application, and prayer. Let's have three people every single day post in the GroupMe. It's not too much that it's overwhelming, but it's enough that it kind of stirs all of our thinking to like, oh, snap. I don't know if I did my Bible reading today. And so it's this healthy, built-in way that we're supporting one another in this. We've had other groups do things like do scripture memory together online. There's apps called the, the Scripture Memory app. It used to be called Scripture Typer, where you can do this with groups from your microchurch. We had a few people that... They've got these like smaller groups within their microchurches, an online microchurch called Tiny Groups. And so they started a, a group text thread and, and just began encouraging one another and holding one another accountable every single day to seek Jesus. Listen, this is an opportunity where just like in the book of Acts, we can be growing in our relationship with God and his word and we're doing it together. Everybody say together. I don't know if you're really saying it, but if you didn't, you got to deal with God, okay? Because your pastor told you to, okay? So number one, they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, number two, and fellowship. Everybody say fellowship. Fellowship. The, the word for this in the original language in the Greek is koinonia. Koinonia, it means this real, authentic, deep connection. Again, we've, we've started trying to engineer, to figure out, to stumble on some answers. How do we do real, deep connection and fellowship online, digitally. And so we started online microchurches. Let me be honest with you. We never really done this before, at least here in South Florida. And so my expectations were like, eh, you know, we're going we're gonna to see how it goes. And we jumped in last week or two weeks ago, we jumped in our first online microchurch. It was great. Like afterwards, I remember talking with my wife, Nancy. I was like, babe, that was so much better than I thought it would be. And guess what we found? Even online, people are still people 
Who would have thought? Like you could still have deep connection and encouragement even in the midst of this digital age. I, I'll never forget one of the guys, we sort of break out at the end, guys and girls, what we call tiny groups, and it's just kind of gender-based accountability, prayer, sharing, encouragement. And, and so we're going around, and, and it's just, it's real, man. These guys, we're not like up there, oh, bless the Father, I'm having a fantastic week. We're like, man, the struggle's real. We're just sharing our hearts, right, encouraging one another. And one of the guys, a few guys had gone, he starts sharing. He's like, man, it's been a tough season. He's a small business owner. Some of you can relate. He's like, man, it's, it's scary. It's challenging. I'm trusting God. But at the same time, this is what he said. He said, but you know, I'm feeling the weight of everything. It feels so heavy. I'm pressing in to try to trust God. But looking at all of your faces right now on the screen reminds me that I'm not alone. It was beautiful. See, friend, you need community. And I need community, and we need community always, but now more than ever, life-giving, uplifting community. Here's a great application right smack dab in the middle of the sermon. If you have not already, jump into an online microchurch this week. Give it a shot. W why not? I mean, you've got the time. When are you going to run, do more run-throughs on Netflix? You've already done your whole watch list at this point on Netflix. Give it a shot. Um, jump onto our website. Jaleesa's got more information at the very end for how we can help you. We'd love to help you connect, but do it. The other thing it talks about is the breaking of bread. Now, you might think, well, well we can't definitely do that now in this age, but here's what you need to understand. The breaking of bread in the ancient world was not simply about a meal. In the ancient world, in the culture that the scripture was penned in, to, to share a meal, to break bread with someone, it represented a deep act of intimate connection and friendship. What this is pointing to is not simply the quantity, but the quality of fellowship that we see in the book of Acts. It was real. It was deep. It was genuine. It, it wasn't just some superficial surface level, how you doing, brother? Praise God, too blessed to be stressed. Ah, it was... It was true. They, they were really letting people in. They devoted themselves to, to doctrine, to, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and, and lastly, to prayers. Now, let me get to do a little, a little comprehension test here, a little show of hands. How many of you feel there is room for improvement in your prayer life? Show of hands. Raise your hand right now. You can raise your hand in the chat box if you want, wherever you're joining. Okay, for, for the Mother Teresa's out there, God bless you. But for the rest of us mere mortals, okay, we would all probably admit that we would like to grow in this area when it comes to prayer. Again, this is our moment to do it. And we can do it together. Again, we've begun experimenting, and, and part of me is just trying to toss out ideas for some of our online microchurches, online microchurch leaders, disciples of Jesus in our church to start thinking. In our microchurch, we, we, we kind of started matching people up as sort of old school prayer partners. And so every single day, the challenge was, hey man, every single day, connect with this person from your online microchurch and, and just pray with them. You could do it on the phone, you could do it over FaceTime or over Zoom. Connect with them, pray with them. If God gives you an encouragement for them, share that encouragement every single day. It was, it was was great. I've started experimenting with Marco Polo, which is like a, a video messaging app where you can send video messages back and forth for encouragement. We've got a prayer and fasting guide that we've already be do, been doing at the greenhouse every single month. It's about to come. It's about to come out at the end of this month, beginning of next month. We've got Easter coming up, like Jaleesa mentioned, April 12th. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like. My guess is probably online, but it's happening and people are going to be thinking about Jesus. Let's begin to pray. If we want Book of Acts realities, then we need to devote ourselves to Book of Acts priorities. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And what happened? What happened? Do you remember? Yeah, God added, God added to their numbers daily, right? That is what happened. But something actually happened first. This is really where I want to go. As I've been praying, really for the last two weeks, I'm like, I felt something in my heart more poignant and deeper than I think I ever have before. And I think it's just because of the season that we're in. Before God added to their numbers daily, something else happened first. Check this out. Check out what happened after all this deep fellowship and connection with God and one another. They're praying together. They're worshiping together. They're, they're going into the scriptures together. They're having this deep fellowship. Check this out. Verse 44 in Acts 2. It says, and all the believers were what? Together and had everything in common. Are you going to talk about socialism right now? No, I'm talking about the Bible. That's what I'm going to talk about right now. No one told them to do this, but they sold all their possessions and goods and gave to anyone as they had need. This, this is wild to me. 
This is wild to me. That as a result of loving God and spending deep, intentional time with one another, right now we've got to do that digitally, their hearts began to be transformed. And all of a sudden, the stuff that was rightfully theirs, they joyfully gave to those in need. Here's the application. You're like, John, what, what's sort of at stake? What, what are the stakes right now if we were to do this, if we were to live this, if we live this out right now in this hour, what could happen? Here's my answer. The book of Acts could happen. The book of Acts could happen. I, I've heard a lot and I've heard a lot, especially in this season. Man, we, we wanna care for our city. We wanna love our city. We wanna pastor our city. And I say a resounding Amen to that. That is the appropriate heart posture for a follower of Jesus in the midst of this hour. Here is what the Bible tells us. If we want to love, pastor, reach, serve, bless our city, here's what God says. You start with your family and your faith family and your church family. Check this out in Galatians 6. Paul's writing, he says, therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Whenever you have an opportunity, man, by all means, you do good to everybody because every single human being is created in the image of God. Every single person has dignity, value, and worth. Don't miss the point, he says, but, but especially to those of the household of faith. Check this out a little later in Acts, we see how this experiment turned out. Acts chapter four, it says this, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. This is crazy, right? Who does this kind of stuff? You can't stop the church. They shared everything they had. And with great power, the apostles continued to, to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. This, by the way, is why when you get things like forced communism, forced socialism, it never works and it always breaks down. Because it's dependent if it's going to work on God's grace, his love. It's organic from the start, prompted by God. God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy persons among them. Can you imagine? I started thinking about this. I'm like, man, they're there. They're devoting themselves to the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. Their hearts get softened by God. Their hearts get connected to one another and they just start meeting needs and they just start loving one another. And they just start caring for one another. And they're like, you know what? I got an extra thing and you don't have any of this thing. I'll give it to you. Why not? I love you. I really started thinking, church, I want us to dream for a moment. I get it. It feels like the sky is falling. Can we acknowledge that Jesus is not scrambling in heaven? Like, what do I do about coronavirus? Oh, my goodness. Right? He's, he, he's seated calmly because he knows the end from the beginning. Can you imagine what would happen if we began to live this out? Up to this point, I feel like some of the narrative has been like, oh my goodness, look at Christians. Oh my gosh, look at churches. Like imagine if we started doing this. Imagine if it could be said of Greenhouse Church and like capital C, Crossway Church and Calvary Chapel. Imagine if it could be said, man, and there were no needy persons among them. And, and a watching world starts saying, oh my goodness, look at Christians. Oh my goodness, look at churches. Like man, I... I I kind of feel a little awkward because most of my life I've kind of made fun of Christians and churches and now I, I kind of want to be one. Do, do you realize the moment, the hour that we are in right now to shine and be the church? Man, I, I'm already starting to cry. Goodness gracious. I practiced this and I cried. I had a conversation with one of the guys in our church who got in a car wreck two weeks ago in the midst of all this craziness. And so he gets, he gets T-boned. He was, you know, he was, he, he was doing fine. The guy kind of hit him. He gets out of his car, frazzled, as you can imagine. It's an elderly gentleman, and he hears the guy praying. And the guy's just praying. And, and, and so my buddy, who's a part of our church, walks up to this guy, and he's like, hey, man, what's going on? And the guy just, I mean, just starts pouring his heart out from the jump. Man, I, I don't know. My, my, my wife is elderly, and she's got pre-existing conditions, and I'm so terrified that she's going to die. And, and so he starts going through. My friend's like, hey, I heard you praying. He said, yeah, I'm a Christian. I, I'm praying to God because I'm so scared, and, and I was trying to get groceries. I wasn't even paying attention. It was totally my fault. I totally hit you. He said, I, I, I'm just so sorry. So the guy in our church had just come from the grocery store. This is a true story. 
just come from the grocery store. He had a car full of groceries. He said, in that moment, John, we had enough, right? We were kind of trying to get extras and everything, not stockpiling crazy. We had enough, but and clear as day, Holy Spirit said, give this man your groceries. He said, so John, I opened up my car and I said, hey man, you're my brother in Jesus. And the guy who just hit him with his car, he gave his groceries to. The guy starts crying. The cops show up. This guy's crying. Our, my, the guy from our church is praying with him. The police officer is so baffled. He, I can't even imagine the conversation in the squad room that happened that evening. Man, y'all are going, you're never going to imagine what happened here. And the, what happened? He got to see the church. God's kingdom invaded the car accident uh, report. That's what just that's what just happened. Friends, you, you can't cancel church. But here's what scripture tells us. You might need to identify church. This is where Jesus is so incredible. This is where the wisdom of God is so amazing. Jesus knows that at the foundational level, there will be unprecedented needs in our immediate community, in our church family, and the global community and beyond. There will be. But Jesus knows that at the core, poverty is not simply material. It's relational. It's emotional, it's identity. We don't simply need uh, opportunities to pass out bread to nameless, faceless masses because you don't just need money, you actually need a family. Friends, do you realize this is an opportunity to live out the gospel that we preach? And according to God, we're supposed to start right here with his family. Now listen, I get it. The toilet paper struggle is real, right? You go in grocery stores, it's like you would think, Toilet paper is the necessary remedy to combat coronavirus because it's just, it's not, it no, it's nowhere. The inclination of every single voice that we're hearing in our lives right now is take, grab, hoard, make sure you're covered, make sure your family's safe, look at you. But we already know from Jesus, if you follow Jesus, listen to me, friends, we know this. We do not thrive when we are self-centered and looking out for our own interest alone. We wither when we do that. We thrive when we look out, like Philippians says, not only for our own interests, but also for the interests of others. When we look to God and we, when we allow him, like we see in the book of Acts, to fix our eyes on the needs of others as well. Here's what I want us to do in church. I, I want us to live this. I want us to be who God has created us to be, especially in moments like right now. I mean, just to let you know, as a church, I'm not just telling you to do something, asking you to do something, encouraging you to do something. We're putting our money where our mouth is. This week, we were able to donate tablets with Zoom software to two different elder care facilities because right now they're on lockdown which means they're not getting any visitors, which means that elderly individuals are sitting in these homes, are sitting in these care facilities, not just feeling terrified because of what they're seeing on the news and hearing on the news, but feeling completely isolated and alone. We're like, that's not right. That's not right. Jesus has something to say about that. So church, because you're generous, we were able to step out and provide a bunch of tablets to these different facilities. So now these individuals could have digital visits with their family members and loved ones. I hope there's something in your heart that's like, yes, because that's what we were created for. Let me give you another application. You might not be as excited about this one, but I think it's important. Here's something super practical. There is a high probability, it looks like it's gonna happen at this point, that the government is gonna hand out some big stimulus package and small businesses and individuals will get money they were not intending on. Here's a, here's a crazy idea. What if before we spent it, we prayed about it? Like, what if... What if some of us, you're like, man, I've had an income back gap. I need that money. Amen. Then use it. Some of us, we've been blessed that we can work remotely and our financial situation has not changed. What if instead of spending it, you just said, Jesus, we do talk all the time. Like you're the owner and we're just stewards. Like we do believe that you own everything and our time and our lives and our stuff and our finances are yours. Do you have a game plan for this money that I was not planning on getting? And maybe he's going to prompt your heart just like he did in the book of Acts because God is the same like Robert said yesterday, today, and forever. Maybe he's going to prompt your heart with a specific family, with a specific need, with a specific opportunity. Man, I dare you to ask. And I'm praying you have the courage to obey. You might be listening in. You're not a Jesus follower. You're like, y'all are crazy. <laughs> Why in the world would someone give away what they don't have to? what rightfully belongs to them? And it's a fair question. And the answer is because it's what God did for us. Check out this video as we get ready to close.
Friends, this is the gospel. This is the gospel. It says in Philippians that Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. Church, let me just call us to be who we are. We give because he gave and we love because he first loved us and we devote ourselves to God and to one another because when we were so lost, so broken, so stubborn, so wandering, he was so devoted that he came down and sent his son on a search and rescue mission to save us from our sin and from ourselves. You say, how in the world does someone respond to a love like that? What do you even do? And the only answer I've ever been able to come up with is you love with everything you are. You say I love you back with your life and with your time and with your words and with your passion and with your energy. And you sprint through that finish line until, until your, your number's called and your end comes and then you're with them for eternity. Here's what I want us to do. I want us to love him back, church. I want us to go all in. I want us to surrender everything to the one who is worthy of it all because you know it is in the best hands that you could ever place it in. Let's pray. Jesus, you are so incredible. There is no one like you. There's no deity, there's no religion, there's no worldview that even compares. Holy Spirit, move on our hearts right now. You can keep your heads bowed and, and your eyes closed just for a moment of quiet and privacy between you and God. If, if you're here and you wanna surrender to devote your life to God through Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, if you would like to repent, this is a Bible word. It means to, to shift your mind, which inevitably precipitates a shift in heart posture and ultimately actions. If you'd like to repent and turn from self-reliance to God dependence, to make Jesus Lord and leader, you can do that right now. Wherever you're at, I just want you to say these words, I surrender. You can type it in the chat box, I surrender. There's no magic prayer to pray, something along the lines of Jesus, you got my attention, I surrender. I'm yours, forgive me, heal me, rescue me, change me, teach me to follow you. Maybe you're here and and you're already a follower of Jesus, but something inside your heart is stirring and you would like to commit yourself to see Book of Acts realities by devoting yourself back to Book of Acts priorities, Bible, fellowship, prayer, and generosity. If that's you, if you're in that boat, I want you to say right now, I surrender. God, I surrender. You can go ahead and look up at me if you're not already. Listen, if you just repented, if you just prayed either of those prayers with me, there is a high probability that God is doing something amazing and supernatural in your heart right now. Here's what you do in response to that. You tell somebody. I mean, matter of fact, even right there, if you're on church online, if you're somewhere where you could type in, why don't you just type in, man, God's working. Jesus is working in my heart. Maybe a friend invited you. Maybe someone invited you via text or via social media. I want you to go ahead and shoot them a text right now. Say, I just prayed Jesus is working in my life. Jump on FaceTime with them right now. Say, okay, you got to tell me more about this Jesus thing because I think it's real and I just, God's doing something with me right now. Listen, I would I deeply encourage you to jump into one of these online microchurches, to, to devote yourself to some life-giving, uplifting community, especially in this crazy time. Jaleesa will give you more details about that in just a moment so that you can thrive in the midst of this hour right now. Church, God bless you. I love you. And I'll see you this week on Church Online. 